Many times when choosing a payroll service, you have to choose between a new startup with a great app or an established company whose tech may feel behind the times. With OnPay, you get the best of both worlds, a great app from an established company that's been providing payroll services for over 30 years in all 50 states. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, OnPay, later in the episode. So did I mention that headline, tax season turns into dumpster fire for advisors, clients after stimulus bill passes? I thought that was a great encapsulation on accounting today of basically how everything is going with all these changes happening in the middle of tax season. I mean, I think we had a, an episode title last May about dumpster you know, fire, peep, dumpster fire, you know, in the PPP program. So, so just now it's, it's, it's gone beyond just PPP. The whole, the tax filing deadlines, the tax changes, the guidance, the whole thing's been a dumpster fire then. Today is Saturday, March 20th. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. So David, uh, I, I was telling you a couple weeks ago that I realized my brother-in-law hadn't gotten a PPP loan. That's right. Yeah, you you were shocked that he nobody helped him do this. Yeah, because he's a musician. So, like, of all the people that need the loan, that qualify for it, that experienced economic uncertainty, he is the one. He's like the case study for this as a sole proprietor. And so I helped him do it. We applied, and he got like twenty grand in his bank account. I feel like a hero. And, and I can't believe... You should charge him a finder's fee. Or you should, you should take <laughs> care illegal. of you. <laughs> I, think it's I think that's illegal under the... Well, I can't, you can't... Not, not if it's anyways. family. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a, my birthday present to him because it was recently his birthday. So oh, I, I, nice. I, won, nice I won the birthday present contest. And it astounds me too that we still have like a ton of firms that never even dipped their toes into PPP that didn't want anything to do with it. And But, but those that did know... You know what I'm talking about. If you're listening and you got into PPP for your clients and you helped them get it, you're a hero to them now. Well, I'm a hero in my family. And he wasn't the only one. I helped some others because, you know, we're, we're uh, freelancers and self-employed folks. And so they all, anyone who had Schedule C, I helped them out. So I feel good about that. You know, I, I still got, I still got the magic touch as a CPA, even if it's just friends and family. And more people are getting stimulus money. Did you get your stimulus money, David? Yes, I did. I was a uh, very nice surprise. Thank you, uh, Joe Moneybags. <laughs> Is that what they're calling you now? Hash I think there's a hashtag like Joe Moneybags. Or Joe Moneybags? I like that a lot. Bag. I like that. Uh, the U.S. Treasury has sent out $242 billion in stimulus, stimulus checks so far. That's as of March 17th in accounting today. That is more than half of the $410 billion in stimulus payments to individuals that Congress approved earlier this month. So we're done with stimulus. There's no more money coming, no more talk about that. Now it is on to recovery and spending all of that money. Let me interrupt here. So okay. I have a rental house and my rental house, and this ties to these stimulus checks. Uh, my tenant's leaving. I have to re-rent this house. I need a new tenant on April 1st. The last time I rented this house was about two and a half years ago, three years ago. And it, I, it sat empty for three months. I could not get anybody to rent this house. Nobody wanted to pay the deposit. Nobody, you know, People are trying to talk your rent down by half, et cetera, et cetera. I put it up for rent basically the night everybody got their stimulus checks deposited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Smart. I rented this Smart. house. I rented this house, signed lease with deposit. People Venmoed me money, et cetera, signed lease within 18 hours. Congratulations. Well, that's a good sign. So so, so this is this just a thought in the future. If you're going to put a rental property up, do it on a week. The government puts 2,600 bucks into somebody's account. <laughs> that's the way to, that's when to you do it. You have good timing. You have good timing, David. I, I got lucky, thankfully. And I actually, and I feel like I have a home run tenant, which is even better. So... This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Rewind. QuickBooks Online backs up their platform, but not your client's files, leaving you exposed to failed imports, bad app integrations, or manual data entry errors that can corrupt your client's files. It takes you hours of work to manually restore it all, pretty much erasing those great profit margins you have because you're using the cloud. Rewind automatically backs up your QuickBooks Online files and in a couple of clicks can restore your client's file to the way it was prior to any mishaps. To learn even more about Rewind, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash rewind. 
That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-W-I-N-D. And the team at Rewind also wanted me to let you know about an upcoming CPA Academy webinar on March 25th that they will be hosting called Building Out Security Protocols for Your Practice. You'll earn CPE credit while you learn how to protect your firm and clients' data. Hit the show notes for the link. And David, you are a small business owner in that you own that rental property. I think technically, right? You qualify as that. There is good news from other small business owners. According to a survey by Cabbage, the American Express-owned fintech lender, they surveyed a few hundred small businesses around the country and found that 57% of businesses are fully open as local or federal pandemic shutdowns ease. So over half of small businesses are fully reopened. These businesses were also aided by a shift in operations online that helped boost average monthly online sales revenue by, get this, 54% increase in online sales. Now, when they were asked whether pre-pandemic commercial occupancy rates would return in that they would go fully back into their uh, physical retail space, 33% of those businesses said they would expand digital operations to supplement or replace in-person operations. In com- so mm-hmm. just to, to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, so I have a physical location, whatever my business is, and instead of reopening that physical location, I might be scaling that back and investing more of my money into my online my new newly founded online offerings. Correct. Or if you go back into that 100% of the location you had before, you're not going to expand physically. You're going to expand online. That's a third of businesses are focusing on growing online now. Now, about half that, 15%, are going to scale back their digital operations and go back to what they were doing before. So twice as many businesses plan to expand online versus just going back to the way business was done before the pandemic which I think is very similar to the numbers that we saw for accounting firms when it comes to, are you going to go back to your office or are you going to stay online? It's about double the number, if I'm recalling correctly, that are going to going to expand online. And what are these businesses ex- expecting in the future months? It's interesting. The larger businesses are the most bullish about the coming months. They are projecting 46% growth in revenue next month. Medium businesses, 40%. The smallest businesses are only expecting 13%. But everybody's expecting growth. It's just that the larger businesses seem to have the advantage, uh, which is what we saw during the pandemic, because a lot of them were able to stay open as they were deemed essential, right? If you were a Costco, you got to stay open. But if you were some little hardware store, you didn't. And, And so this is, you know, the pandemic has really turned the tables, uh, in, a, in the advantage of the larger businesses. And that's my big concern is that you know, we need this balance of big business and small business in the country because small businesses are the ones that really innovate, are the ones that are creating half the new jobs in the country. So if we don't get those small businesses back on their feet, if we don't get more of them reopen, then we're in trouble uh, when it comes to growth in the future. So the news that 57% of businesses of small businesses are fully open is great, but it's a kind of a glass half full thing in that what what has happened to the other 43%? Are they ever going to open? Did they close permanently? That's what I'm concerned about. I, I want to know, were, were they permanently closed or are they going to come back? Because that's the engine of growth in this economy. Because I think it's kind of hard to tell. Like if, if a store seems shuttered, you don't know, are they just all working from home? And it's not like the landlord has another tenant they can just move in instantly. Right. So stores are probably staying shuttered. And and I'm willing to bet for some of these businesses, even if it's shuttered, the landlord probably would take them back in a heartbeat if they could. Because it's not like there's people banging on their door to uh, take the new lease. Yeah, most of the time not, right? So – some sort of mixed news there, but I like to look at it from a positive standpoint. Now, let's let's turn our attention to the accounting tax world because we are in tax season. The news there is n- probably more pessimistic than optimistic. Would would you agree? I saw this headline in accounting today. Well, it depends on who I, I guess as a taxpayer, 
maybe it's up. It's good for me. I think if you're an individual 1040 filer, it's good because yeah. we saw the deadline extended to May 17th from April 15th recently. So you get an extra month to file your return. But the tax community is not happy about this. Uh, for one thing, there was always the group that said, let's just get it done April 15th. I do not want tax season to go on forever again, like last year. I just want to get it done with. Because oh, last year, you were locked in your house anyways. You couldn't do anything, right? You're, you're just stuck. So why not just work? Yeah. Whatever, yeah. right? Who cared about tax season? But this year, hey, come April 15th, you might have had your, your vaccination shots. People are starting to travel. The weather's getting nice. And you're going to – accounts and bookkeepers are going to be stuck – with a new May 17th deadline. And the deadline doesn't really help anyone other than those individual tax filers because it's not going to extend for businesses. It's not going to extend for the estimated tax payments. Uh, the AICPA has come out against this, saying that because the estimated payments aren't extended, it nullifies the benefit of any postponement since the tax return work has to be done to calculate estimated payments. And more than 9.5 million individual returns filed in 2018 included estimated payments. So basically, it's it's not helping tax pros who are working with anyone who does estimated payments, right? The more complicated returns, the higher net worth individuals. And the response by the IRS commissioner to this is is interesting. He basically said in a congressional hearing that he, they don't want wealthy individuals to get a break on interest and penalties by not having to pay their estimated payments. But it, but it like doesn't even make any sense because it's only like a month, right? It's, it's a month of interest and penalties. It's not, it's, it's, it's a strange argument to make. So anyway, AICPA, I, I was on their town hall, uh, the CPA.com town hall, and they're telling tax pros to, you know, call your congressperson. Like it's to that point where we don't think Obviously, they don't think they can lobby anymore to make this happen. It's going to be have to be a grassroots kind of thing to get this fixed. So is there any talk, or have you ever, historically speaking, from the AICPA to stretch out or balance these dates? And what I mean by that, it's pretty clear after the last two last year and this year that there's really no – April 15th is just an arbitrary date. Yeah. And you can just move around. It doesn't matter. Well, if, if it's just an arbitrary date, why not, you know, hey, everybody that has a last name, A through D – you file your returns, they're due January 15th. And, every, and then like spread it out and have multiple deadlines for the year for, you know, I don't know, maybe that's too hard to manage, but it yeah. feels like if, if, if you just move it, it, cause obviously it's not like the date, like, Hey, everybody has to file the returns because if they, if they don't have it done by that day, then the government can't make their budget or something. There's nothing dependent upon this date. Well, so why it is though, because the cash receipts, right? So that's why they're not delaying these payments because the treasury has to collect money to pay the bills that are due. Yeah. So that's why they don't want to postpone these deadlines because then it creates a cash crunch for the government, especially with all this money going out from stimulus and all that, right? I mean, that's my. But you still theory. have to. You still have to pay um, estimated, right? They're not giving you freedom on that. Right, right, and that's why the deadline extension is no good. Without extending the payment, if you just extend the deadline to file your return, but you still require people to pay on the same date, you're basically requiring people to do the tax work anyway, because you got to do the work to figure out how much you owe. So it's not really helpful. Yeah. And the people that have their, their, in, in your clients that have their act together, they've probably contacted you that said, Hey, give me, can you file an extension? You probably already filed the extension. It's all the people that don't have their act together. They always wait till April 14th. Now they're just going to wait till May 16th. Right. Yeah, exactly. Hey, and and, and, and that, you'll see this probably in the intuit earnings as well. Like over, historically speaking, I think TurboTax as TurboTax got faster and easier to use, people would just wait later and later and later to file their taxes. Oh, yeah. I'm one of those people that does it, you know, like two hours before the deadline. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> you're going to see, um, will this move April, May? This might impact like into its quarterly earnings, right? It'll, it'll shift it or over some. It's so possible. We'll, we'll see how this all, all falls through. But it's good because like, I, I don't have time in three weeks to pull my taxes together. So I'm, I'm like, oh, it's May 17th. <laughs> you're happy. Uh, so there is some good news here. The IRS is saying that they're going to automatically calculate the unemployment benefits change. So the new stimulus law exempted the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits. Uh, so people who have already filed their returns are wondering, well, now am I going to have to refile? No, you don't. 
the IRS is just going to automatically calculate that and I guess issue you a check if you are due a refund for paying tax on that. So that's something good there. We've also got an extension of the PPP deadline. The Paycheck Protection Program has been extended until May 31st. So those of you who have a brother like Blake who has not gotten their loan, here's your chance to be the hero. You can be the hero. There's still money left in the program as far as I know. I haven't heard anything about it running out. And all those sole proprietors, hopefully if they haven't filed already for their PPP, they can get it. I think I saw, and it wasn't this article, but I saw a different article where only like 5 to 6% of the smallest businesses have gotten any stimulus funds. Like So, so if, you, if you have smaller clients, 96% of them are not get, have not gotten a PPP loan yet. It does not surprise me because going through this process with my family who are not financially savvy has made me realize just how poorly designed the program is. First, it is not advertised well. They had no clue this was even available to Schedule C freelancers. Wait a minute. They don't list, you don't have them subscribe to the podcast, Blake? This is unacceptable. You know, they don't listen to the podcast. Unfortunately, all of America doesn't listen to this. Uh, yeah, and it's not like this was advertised. So a lot of people who could get this, this money didn't know about it, unless they happen to have an accountant. But we also know that half of small business owners don't even have an accountant. I saw that stat. I don't remember where, but I saw that recently. So all the people who don't have accountants don't know about it. And then of the people who do have accountants, it's something like only half of accounting firms were even helping people with PPP. Anyway, very poorly designed. And yeah, it, you know, money's not, I don't know where I was going with that, but basically the a lot of people who need the stimulus from the Paycheck Protection Program, the smallest small businesses are not getting it because they just don't know. Oh, and what else I was going to say is that the application process is really confusing. It may seem simple to us, right? It only requires, you know, something like four pieces of documentation, but still like going through that portal and trying to figure out the application and answering the eight questions and it's hard. It's hard for most small business owners. So I, I helped with that. But anyway, hopefully next time when we do this kind of thing, we don't do it with a loan application. Like that's just the worst way to issue what really is just stimulus. It should have just been a grant. You apply, you get the money, you don't have to apply for forgiveness. Anyway, so did I mention that headline, tax season turns into dumpster fire for advisors, clients after stimulus bill passes? I thought that was a great encapsulation on accounting today of basically how everything is going with all these changes happening in the middle of tax season. I mean, I think we had a an episode title last May about dumpster you know, fire, dumpster <laughs> fire, you know, in the PPP program. So, so just now it's 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 gone beyond just PPP. <laughs> the whole the tax filing deadlines, the tax changes, the guidance, the whole thing's been a dumpster fire. Then, yep. Uh, and the last bit of news here on delays and extensions is the SBA has deferred the repayment of disaster loans, the EIDL loans for COVID-19, those are going to extend from 12 months to 24 months from the date of the note. So most loans, I guess all disaster loans made in 2020 will not be due until 2022. So something to look forward to next year. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. Not sure if you know it or not, but OnPay was one of our very first sponsors and their support was crucial in the early success and growth of this podcast. So it has been equally exciting for me to watch them grow and have success as well. During this time, OnPay grew from an unknown payroll app into a top-rated app by CPA Practice Advisor, and in 2020, they've even received the coveted PC Mag Editor's Choice Award for Best Payroll Software. If you're wondering why OnPay is the best, it is because they handle all the complicated stuff that other payroll providers don't, like agricultural payrolls, including Form 943, multi-state payrolls, employees with H-2A visas. Even while handling all this complicated stuff, OnPay remains an easy-to-use, full-service payroll and HR app that is the right fit for all of your clients, whether you just have one employee to pay or 500 employees to pay. It'll help them stay organized, save time, and get compliant. OnPay includes best-in-class integrations to benefit providers, workers' comp plans, QuickBooks, and Zero. Right now, listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll and HR service. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. 
On pay, nobody takes better care of your clients. So, so I have three articles that uh, are a little bit about you know people getting their feathers all ruffled up here on the internet. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> over that, a lot of know, things. Uh, so not tax related. <laughs> not, not tax related. So the first one is. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, BDO, and actually I'll read the headline. So this is directly from Zero's uh, blog post. BDO and Zero join forces in a global agreement. And it's very strong headline, and it's a very strong headline on social media. Yeah, because BDO is one of the largest accounting firms in the United States. I forget exactly what their rank is, but they're up in the top 10. I think they're top seven in the world now, BDO. I think uh, I, I was checked recently. So People, I think, only saw the headline, and there was a lot of there was a lot of discussion and, and overreacting possibly to the headline. But if you take the time to actually read the article, so I'll just uh, highlight a couple of things. So Zero has signed a three year global agreement with BDO, and BDO has been awarded the Zero Global Partner status for a global engagement. So when you talk about global for BDO, that's basically outside the U.S. It's their BDO Global division. And it's really clear in the very bottom of the article. So this is the point, people, you have to read these things. You can't just use the headlines. <laughs> so the second to last paragraph, it says the initial participating firms are expected to include BDO, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and Canada. So it's basically the four countries where zero is really strong, which makes sense. But it's everybody was freaking out like, oh my gosh, does this mean BDO is not going to do QuickBooks? Or does this mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's... And for those who don't know... BDO. BDO is one of the biggest QuickBooks online partners in the United States. So that's why this was a big announcement and why the headline was shocking to some folks who are deep in the QuickBooks world because they're thinking, oh, does that mean that BDO is dropping QuickBooks? And I think a common knowledge is yes, BDO is, has a lot of QuickBooks people. And so that's why everybody, I think everybody's overreacted a little bit to this because they didn't read the article. It's very clear if you read it and you get down to the bottom. It's but the global ones. This was all and, and it makes sense though, right? If you're BDO and you're in Australia, you kind of have to use zero or part you, you probably want to partner with zero, right? They have a million customers in Australia. It all make like there's nothing shocking. The, the headline is very strong, but there's nothing shocking about this or eye opening. So there's some other big hubbub happening. Um, and this is actually people are very fired up about this. So QuickBooks, historically speaking, if you did ACH in QuickBooks and QuickBooks Online for, I feel like it might've been a decade. You got to do your ACH for 50 cents to a buck, somewhere in there. And it was a flat, Some people have flat fee. Flat, flat right. fee, right? And so, which is huge. That's why people loved QuickBooks payments. A lot of accountants and bookkeepers love to use that to get ACH payments from their clients. Well, Intuitive's changed this. And actually, I think I talked about this change when it affected us or me. Um, I went to... I opted in a year ago to this and got put on the new program, which is 1% fee with a max of $10 per transaction. So instead of it being, uh, you know, paying $1,000, receiving $1,000. So instead of you just paying 50 cents, you're not going to pay 10 bucks. Yeah, it's a big increase, right? 10 to 20 times as much as you were paying before. Yeah. And with this, the bank transfers will be deposited next day. So, so it's going to tie to the faster deposits. Uh, if you get the QuickBooks Cash Bank account, there's no fees, right? So some of this is probably to drive people to their QuickBooks cash bank account. But I have talked to some accounting firms. You know, I've talked to accounting firms where you know this could be twenty thousand dollars in fees just from their own clients, right? Yeah, so yeah. people are the accounting community is very upset about this, and you know, it is what it is. I mean, if I was into it, just hypothetically speaking, I would always make it free, ACH free for accountants to build their clients. Now, now all the clients can pay, but you exactly. Know, but you get, you know, you got to give us those perks, right? That's that's how you build the love in the accounting community is give us free software. Uh, every app, you know, if you're listening and you have an app and you're not giving an accountant a free accountant edition of your app, you're you're missing out because <laughs> we're we're spoiled. We're used to it. We want a subscription to use for our own firm so we can test it out. So, what's your last kerfuffle, David? Oh, the last kerfuffle. <laughs> Ker yeah. Kerfuffle. <laughs> I'm not even going to repeat that. All right, so the last, I'll pause. So the last one is not so much accounts and bookkeepers, but it's just a general revolt against the 30% mafia. The 30% mafia. What is that? So this is the the nickname or the term that's being used 
And it comes from the mafia, right? Back in the olden days, you know, maybe uh, if your grandpa was running a business in New York City, you know, maybe you had a little bakery or barbershop, right? And the mafia would come around once a week and be like, I need 30% of your income. I need 30% of your income. Wow. It was that much. And, and so, it, yeah. And so what's happening is there's this big pushback because now all basically all of big tech from Apple to DoorDash and everybody in between is deciding they should get 30% of everything of the entire economy. That's what they've been doing on their app stores for years and years. Ever since Apple started the app store, they charged 30% on transactions from apps in the store, right? And it was going to be 27%, which is what they did for iTunes for musicians. Mm -hmm. And they just sat out and surrounded up to 30. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> right? So, and then that model has been there and Amazon does it. And you talk to your DoorDashes, your Ubers, your Grubhubs. And the restaurant people are probably the most up in arms about this because their margins are so thin. If you have an app and you're making a 90% margin and Apple takes... 30%, okay, whatever, right? But if your margins are thin because you're a restaurant, by the time a restaurant, you know, usually they it's kind of a, a third, a third, a third, right? So a restaurant will have- What do you mean a third? A third. Of, a third, a third. A third. So a, rev a restaurant has X revenue. A third is just going to be there for food and drinks. They have to buy food and drinks. Right. A third goes to labor. And then if you basically pay 30% to delivery apps, you have a 10% left for rent, utilities, chefs, managers, linens, um, it's not insurance, point of, point of sale software, takeout boxes, equipment, plumbing, dishwashers, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So the restaurants are really up in arms about this. And a lot of them are starting to push back and go around this or add a fee. If you use one of these apps, a restaurant's charging a fee. And so this is not just you know the restaurants. This is across all aspects of the economy right now. Big tech is taking away tons of – they're taking 30% of everything, of every transaction in the economy. You rent a movie, 30% of that's gone. But this is changing because I, I just saw a report that the Google Play Store, which had been charging 30%, is now going to charge 15% up to the first $1 million. If you're a smaller developer, yes, for the small. And Apple's th that's actually following the lead of Apple, which was getting a ton of pressure on this. Uh, so they've also cut their fees. And then there's a big uh, battle because there's a lot of Republicans that are – really driving this this pushback on big tech because big tech is not donating to Republicans as much. They're donating to Democrats more. Mm -hmm. and, but then there's a big PR battle. So what's happening is the lobbyists uh, on the other side are saying, hey, just to let you know, the same people that want to break up big tech and think it's a racket are the same people that said Trump won the election and that measles vaccine is a communist conspiracy. So there's a big battle happening over this 30% mafia and it's ugly and now the politics right is getting involved. I think we saw South Dakota try to pass something and then Arizona you talked about that last week mm -hmm. the week before. So this is this battle is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger and I don't know what the right response is because in general historically finders fees if you want to call them that or an agency fee has always been kind of like a 15% Right. But big tech has turned it into this 30%. And it doesn't really, if you're on the other side of this, it doesn't really add up. I mean, and think about it. Look, look at the impact of 1%. QuickBooks is charging a 1% fee with a $10 max and it ripples. That could be a, a, a large amount. If you're an accounting firm, you could pay 20 grand in ECH fees. If you have 150 clients, $1,000 a month each client. Right? Mm -hmm. So it adds up fast. So now if you're a different, a smaller business or a different type of business and somebody's taking one third, I actually, I don't think if we were doing the podcast and somebody was going to take one third of all our advertising money, I don't think I'd even do the podcast. So the question is, you know, can the free market sort this out? And I guess the answer to that is, well, there's only two app stores that anyone uses. And one of them is completely dominating most sales, right? Apple. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's the vast majority of apps earn revenue on the app store, the Apple app store. So is regulation appropriate? But it's not just the app stores, right? It's the delivery oh, apps. The delivery apps, yeah. It's it's the uh, travel sites. It's it, basically if you want to do stuff in e-commerce, some or, or you want to do something on the internet, some they're going to charge a tax, a 30% tax to do to do commerce on the internet, there's a 30% tax. But, well, it's but there's a free market here. Like there are how many delivery apps are there now? I can think of at least five that I have used. So if I'm a restaurant and I don't want to pay 30% to Uber Eats, why don't I just use something else? Because the other one's 30%. Hence, hence the mafia, 
right? Like they're all in cahoots together. That's that. That's the problem with this. It's not like somebody. It's not like there's some startup here that's like, hey, we we have a business model. We'll do it for ten percent, right? Because what'll happen is these bigger companies, and this is what this is why there's a pushback on tech. The big company will just go acquire that other company, and it's over. Right. That's the problem. That's the problem. All the disruptors get acquired. Well, and that was the big concern about you know Intuit acquiring. Uh, what was it? Um, Credit Karma. Credit Karma. Because Credit Karma had a free tax product and it looked like Intuit, you know, the perception was that Intuit was just acquiring Credit Karma to protect TurboTax. And this was uh, a- and they were forced to divest that, you know, and, and, and sell the tax prep service to someone else. And this is a long read article on Medium, so we'll put it in there. It's a, like a nine minute read. But I'd love to hear, I know we have a ton of bookkeepers that listen to the show that have restaurants. I would really love to understand like how you, how you're you're helping your clients navigate around the restaurants. Like call and leave us a voicemail on this because I know there's got I know our accounts and bookkeepers have opinions of this. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear. Like like are these fees helping your small business owner stay in business? Because without that, they'd have no sales. Well, David, you brought us into App News, so let's talk about that. I spotted a another funding round from an app. This is called, it looks like it's pronounced Trulian. It is a lease workflow startup that has secured 3.5 million in seed funding. This round is co-led by venture capital funds, Graycroft and Aleph. The way Trulian works is by translating large data sets from PDF contract files, Excel and other sources into a single system for accounting teams. Currently, the software offers modules for lease accounting and revenue recognition. The company has a partnership with Deloitte. The firm is going to introduce Trulian to clients in need of compliance around lease accounting. So instead of it just scanning bills or invoices like a receipt bank and auto entry, a hub doc, this is going to actually look at the lease and it can figure out the payment terms and all that that's listed in the lease and turn that into financial data. That's a great way to think about it. Think of this as the next level of OCR technology. If you can extract data from a receipt, why can't you use more advanced AI to extract the terms of a contract, of of a lease in a contract? There's an update from Sage Intact. They have released their first update in 2021. Act2.com, one of their resellers did a write-up on their blog. A lot of small changes here for Sage Intact the cloud ERP. The one that stuck out to me was their bank feed enhancements. Now, Sage Intact will automatically refresh bank fees, bank feeds every four hours, which actually is something I don't even think you get in Zero or QuickBooks Online at this point. So uh, you can make sure that you are updating transactions every few hours in your accounting system now. Which makes sense for bigger companies too, because yeah. the, the amount of data that keeps coming through, because I, I think the equivalent, right? If, if for me, if I'm checking every two days, the equivalent really for a bigger firm is going to be every hour, right? These, these enterprise firms, yeah. so four is a big job, but it's funny to watch how, you know, a year and a half ago, there was no bank feeds. They didn't exist in, at the enterprise level software, right? It was something all the QuickBooks and not mine and zero users had for a decade. And now, like now they're leapfrogging it or they're passing that functionality. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's all about getting to the real time data, right? If you want, if you want to be able to do forecasting, you need that trial balance up to date as well, and you can't do that unless you've got all your transactions in the GL. So uh, this need for constantly knowing where you're going, where you're going to be, is what's driving this improvement in uh, accounting workflows. Do you see that Stripe took another round? I was just going to say that ninety five billion dollar valuation. That is amazing. And they're going to go public. Isn't that what's happening this year? That's the plan anyway? Yeah, I think it's going to – this possibly makes it the biggest public or the biggest private company in the history of the internet. I think I've seen some some talks. It's arguably – I forgot what the other company was. Um, oh, the Alibaba Jack Ma thing that completely fell apart in China. But oh, yeah. They, 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 but this is a pretty major deal. And the one stat I saw in the article was interesting. So over 200,000 new companies have signed up for Stripe since the pandemic began a year ago, which ties back to your, your article about how many small businesses are now doing stuff in e-commerce. Yeah, because Stripe is the easiest way to set up credit card processing online. And to put this in perspective, the amount they raised is $600 million. 
$95 billion valuation. Crazy. So you know who else raised a bunch of money? One of my favorite website builders, Squarespace. They raised $300 million and are now valued at $10 billion. Uh, there's really not much else there other than they raised a bunch of money. I wouldn't be surprised if they went public sometime soon. I use them personally for my own website. I think you know it's a great, great solution to build your first website. Like awesome, awesome tools there. So check it out. I have another raise that occurred. So this goes into the, let's put this in the file cabinet of people we didn't expect to be in our business, to mm -hmm. be in our, in, in our space. Do you know who uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg is? The name rings a bell, but I don't know who. He's a, a big Hollywood mogul. He's uh, DreamWorks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So, so, in that, so he was kind of the, a, part, a piece of that DreamWorks um, production company. And then uh, he has a, his own investment company called Win. W I N D R Co. Winder Co. Maybe mm -hmm. it's Wonder. Wonder Co. Yes. But there's no vowels. It's all been removed. It's and then um, Michael Ovitz, who I'm not really familiar with, but apparently he's a big agent, big, huge power Hollywood agent. They just invested in a production payroll startup called Rapbook. And for their Series A, $27 million round. So it's a payroll startup focused on Hollywood productions, if you want to think about that. And, 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 entertainment and so because right now historically it's all been very manual because you have to figure out meals and who's paying whose uh union insurance is paying for who and there's production fees and all this crazy stuff like for the cast and crew on every movie set so there and that's why if you ever watch in the um the credits of a movie you always see like the payroll and the payroll assistant because it's just like it's a nightmare somebody has to manage that whole process every single time so what's happened is they built this this payroll app and ecos almost like an ecosystem because now 12% of the workers that are on its platform reuse their profile. So because if you move to a different movie set, it's almost like you're moving to a new enterprise to get a new job. Right. It is. Right? And so your profile moves with you. And so the, the new employer, you're just ready to go. Andrew Zahorowitz is in, in, uh, involved in this. So it's got real like real backing behind this. And yeah. they're, they solved the problem. that. And I think about this, right? And this goes back. I always talk about niche, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And I've talked about, and I know I've seen like niche uh, apps for salons because, like, a salon, somebody renting your chair at the salon could be paid three ways. They could be an employee, they could be a 1099 vendor, they could be somebody just renting the chair. And an app that can handle all those three of those use cases is always going to win over an ADP or a Gusto or a Paychex or any of the typical traditional payroll products. And now you look at this and, like, this is taking another slice away. Well, but it's people that weren't even using those services. Maybe they were doing it manually because they just yeah. couldn't, you know, yeah. Or, or they possibly were using them, but it's kind of more the, uh, they do all the calculations, they're manually typing it into those other services, a kind of a net pay type, gross up type thing or something. But yeah, they, it just, it's a big slice. I mean, this is mm -hmm. going to slice away a whole section of the payroll market from those other players. Well, let's see. What else do we have in the world of apps? I have a story about CPA education and whether or not it is keeping up with emerging topics. And they are not. That's according to an AICPA slash NASBA report. We can solve this. We can solve this. How's that? Just assign them all to subscribe to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I mean, we do have some educators that, that listen, at least a handful that I know of and have their class listen. So that's true. That's cool. If you're, if you're a student and you're listening, you're ahead of the curve. Here's the headline in Accounting Today. College accounting programs not covering emerging topics. AICPA slash NASBA report. The report is called the Accounting Program Curriculum Gap Analysis Report. And it found that while more than 60% of college accounting programs cover topics such as data analytics and IT audit, less than half are focusing on emerging areas such as cybersecurity, predictive analytics, and system and organization controls. Subjects expected to appear on the 2024 CPA exam, pending results from the current exam practice analysis. So the ASCPA and NASBA have said these are topics that are going to be on the exam in 2024. And here we are in 2021, and half of college programs, college accounting programs, are not covering these topics at all. This is a survey of 300 college accounting programs, ranging in class size from one to over 100 accounting undergrads. So they basically they've started to incorporate modern tech and data skills into their programs, but few are offering more in-depth education on each topic. 
For example, only 15% of accounting programs with 50 or fewer accounting undergrad enrollments were found to be incorporating digital acumen into their curricula, with just over 30% teaching cybersecurity and predictive analytics topics. So the small programs in particular are really struggling with adding in the digital stuff into their accounting programs. So, you know, we got a long way to go to level up the CPA profession. And what, I guess what's interesting about this is it just shows how the CPA exam really leads the curriculum that we're designing the curriculum in accounting to help people pass the CPA exam. But, you know, maybe it would be better if we didn't do that. It's like the cart leading the horse. Like if we're educating accountants, we should probably be educating them based on what they need to be able to do after the CPA exam. What's the pressure of the exam? Right, like everything's designed for the exam because the whole thing is about those three letters, and I, and I don't want to get into some discussion about the value of the three letters, but everything's driven by that. Oh, if I just get those three letters, then my life will be perfect, right? And I'll know everything I need to know. And it's this is just another example of like that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. No, it does increase your earning potential over your entire yes. life, like dramatically. So it's like totally worth it. And well, you especially know, I- versus becoming an architect, like we talked about last week. <laughs> This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Odoo. Do you have a client that has outgrown QuickBooks or Xero? Or do you have a client that is still on QuickBooks Desktop Enterprise Edition because all the current cloud accounting offerings lack the depth of features and controls that your clients need? Or maybe you have a client with legacy desktop ERP system and they are ready to move to the cloud. Let me introduce you to Odoo. Odoo is a highly customizable cloud ERP system with everything your clients need, including dozens of built-in app modules and thousands of third-party apps. The accounting and invoicing modules are always free, so there's no reason not to give Odoo a try today. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Odoo. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-D-O-O. Hey, I've got a story about the CPA exam. So, David... What do you think is more difficult, the CPA exam or the bar exam? The bar exam being the exam that attorneys or lawyers must take in order to become licensed. Would you like to hazard a guess? I I hazard a guess, and, and I'm going to have some data on this possibly. I hazard a guess that the CPA exam is harder. And the reason why is I know bajillions of CPAs, bajillions, and they're all employed. But I also know a weird ratio of lawyers that don't have jobs. There are a lot of lawyers. Yeah. So there's a lot. So I'm like, is it just is it just easier to become a lawyer and, get, and pass the bar exam? And that's why there's just not and there's not enough work. I, I, I don't know. And it's harder to become a CPA, so the demand is there. I, I, there's a less of a supply. I don't know. Well, there, that's my theory. CPA exams tougher. So there's one way to find out, which is to take both exams. Which I just think about that, and I want to like go hide in a hole. <laughs> and th- But there is somebody who did it. Christine Kuglin wrote an article in Accounting Today about her experience having recently taken both the bar exam and the CPA exam. And I just think of Christine Kuglin as sort of like an ultra runner or something like that. I mean, that's just insane to have done that. And, and both recently, like in the last, it sounds like in this article in the last five years, having done both. So... Here is her analysis, a comparison of the bar exam and the CPA exam. So if you want to become a lawyer, you have to go through more education than if you want to become a CPA, because you got to get that law degree, which ends up being about 210 hours of education after your bachelor's. CPAs, you only have to have a bachelor's degree. Many do get a master's, but you don't. Like I was one of the people who didn't. I just earned a certificate after my bachelor's and depending on the state you're in, it's 120 to 150 hours of education. So 210 versus 150 at most. So a little easier on the CPA side. Now, the bar exam is interesting because they do have a uniform bar exam, which many states use, but they also have individual state exams still. Not every state uses the national exam. It is only offered twice a year in July and February. And it's a two-day exam And you have to go to a large testing hall and sit with a bunch of other miserable people for two days. Now, 
you don't find out your result for two to three months and you can't retake it anyway for six months because it's only offered uh, twice a year. So that's pretty painful. The results are posted publicly on a state website so anyone can see if you passed or failed. And this is the interesting thing. You would think that with all that, the bar exam is a lot harder. The first time pass rate on the bar exam is actually around 70%. So vast majority of folks are passing it. Okay, that's the bar exam. Now let's look at the CPA exam. So we have a uniform CPA exam, meaning everyone in every state takes the same exam. It's offered in four sections, and you can take it at your convenience within an 18-month window. So section one, two, three, four, all separate. I take that within 18 months, pass all four within the 18 months, I'm good. And I don't have to go to a big testing center to do this. I can do this at Prometrics testing centers, which are all over the place. Uh, I did it when I was in LA, and there were like a bunch of them I could go to. I drove maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes to get to the one nearest me, and I could take all the exams in any order I wanted. I got the results much sooner. Sometimes it's as soon as a month after. And if you pass, you can just reschedule and take the exam again anytime there's an open slot at a testing center. So that's really nice. Now, here's the interesting thing. What is the first time pass rate for the CPA exam? I mentioned the bar exam is 70% pass. Well, CPA exam actually has a much lower first time pass rate. For all four, it's between 14 and 20%. So that would seem to indicate that the CPA exam is harder to pass all four on the first try, very small group actually do that. Whereas with the bar, it's like most people pass it. So it's sort of a mixed bag here. And the author's conclusion is basically that they are in the end, the same difficulty. It's just different styles. The bar exam is more like a sprint and the CPA exam is more like a marathon. And I think that, you know, because most people don't pass all four on the same go, that is hard, right? You fail one and then you have to restudy and take it again. Whereas with the bar, you're kind of just like, you're done, right? You take it, you're done. And you probably passed it. So anyway, I, I just thought that was an interesting you know, analysis, a really in-depth analysis of the differences between the bar exam and the CPA exam. So, hey, if you're thinking about uh, one or the other, now you know. So I've got some follow-up from a previous Good, episode. I'm tapped out. I, I, I didn't have much news this week. That was All it. right. Well, we'll fill out, we'll fill out the hour with this. Uh, so this is from Mike uh, DePascale. He sent us this story from the state of Massachusetts. They have passed their fiscal year 2021 budget. And there's a provision in here that relates to a story we talked about. Remember the tax zapper software story? Yes. That report about billions of dollars being lost because of these USB drives you plug into your point of sale and it magically makes cash transactions disappear so that you don't have to pay tax on it uh, illegally. Well, the state of Massachusetts is cracking down on this. They are implementing civil penalties of not more than $25,000 for the first offense and not more than $50,000 for each subsequent offense. And that is a fine that will be assessed on persons or entities that sell or offer for sale an automated sales suppression device or phantomware, also known as a tax zapper. Anyone that purchases, installs, transfers, maintains, repairs, or possesses a tax zapper will be subject to a civil penalty of not more than 10000 for the first offense and not more than 25000 for each subsequent offense. So some pretty steep uh, penalties there if you are using tax zappers uh, in the state of Massachusetts. I would expect much more of that to come out from any states that don't, don't have penalties. So hey, thanks, Mike, for sending us that story. One more follow-up. So we covered the GameStop craze. And I think GameStop stock... I haven't looked at it in a while. It's still it's still up like at a ridiculous value. Uh, what is it? Two hundred dollars per share, which is kind of crazy considering that what at the beginning of the year it was sixteen dollars a share. So that has not gone away, and it has drawn attention to this high frequency trading, risky trading, meme stock trading in Congress. A Democrat proposal for a financial transaction tax has been resurrected. And one of the arguments in favor of it is that it will reduce this kind of risky trading and 
funnel money into more, uh, uh, I don't know, responsible or productive areas of the economy. Uh, this is something actually that I think you mentioned years ago when we were recording, uh, like Elizabeth Warren had for a long time proposed a transaction tax on financial trades as a way to fund additional programs in the government. So, so this is back. It has come back. It is 0.1% tax on each sale of stocks, bonds, and derivatives. So, uh, you know, that's looming. It's, it's, it's in the house and we'll see what happens with it. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of, actually part of me thinks that like a small transaction tax might be a good thing, but then the argument against it is that it will make our stock exchanges less competitive. And so people are going to go elsewhere, right? I mean, you can go to the Hong Kong exchange, you could go to a European exchange or something like that. And then, so why, why would we be able to implement this tax without having some huge disadvantage? It's interesting because I, I feel like other transactions you do in your life, there's always, I mean, when you travel. Hotel occupancy right? there's, tax. There's airport. Yes, exactly. Airport this fee or this fee or parking fee. And there's a this extra buck here, there, there. And I mean, it's a lot of local jurisdictions passing these things. And then, but why can't it happen at this level? Like it's, just, it's a, even if it's teeny, right? It, it, it's 10 cents. There's always 10 cents that comes off the top and that adds up a lot, right? At the end of the year. And we have sales taxes of what? Anywhere from five to 10%, depending on where you are in this country. Of every transaction. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like, yeah, like it, I don't know. I would be in favor of a small financial transaction tax and lowering sales taxes. Like let's let's offset this stuff, you know, not just uh, raise taxes. Although I guess you know that's that's what we're kicking down the road. The can that we are kicking down the road is how are we going to pay for all of our stimulus, the trillions of dollars of stimulus, which is why I have my money in Roth IRAs uh, because I do expect taxes to increase dramatically someday. I mean, I, I don't know. It's like we, we don't live in this magical world in which you never have to pay for stimulus unless you believe in mon modern monetary theory, which but like- A I whole generation has gotten away with this <laughs> and they're starting to die off. So like, we just have to hope you know, that it keeps going. Thank you, I baby really, boomers. I, like, they, 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 got a, they got away with this. So I'm just, I don't know if it, I, I, it's going to have to stop somewhere, I guess. You know how I'm getting around? I'm just moving to Mars, right? I'm going to the free colony- of Mars with Elon Musk, and then I won't ever have to pay Earth taxes. <laughs> Except then we'll have something like a T tax, you know, on Mars, right? <laughs> There'll be a whole different kind of tax. Like it's, <laughs> na I mean, it, it's the natural function of humans. I think like war and tax are like the two natural functions of human beings. Well, or in other words, death and taxes, right? Um, all right. Well, that's all the time we've got for this week, and that's all the stories I got. So, um. Anything we should cover before we go? I guess that number that people can call if they want to tell us something. Yes. Where is the number? The number is 202-695-1040. That is 202-695-1040. It goes straight to a Google Voice mailbox. Leave us a one or two minute message and let us know what you're thinking. Any feedback you have on this? Any? I don't know. What, David, what should people tell us? Well, I mean, now that you have an additional month, of time to do your taxes. Take a break. Take a day off. You know, listen to the podcast. Leave us a voicemail. Leave us a review. Because like all these things, like it's amazing. I can watch um, the numbers stop. Like people stop writing reviews during busy season. <laughs> like, they stop calling us in the voicemail. It's very obvious. Like our numbers are impacted by the busy season. And so take a day off. Take a breath. You still got. You know, it's still going to be there come uh, May fifteenth now. And if you want to get in touch with me online, I am at Blake T. Oliver on Twitter. What about you, David? I'm at David Leary. And if you're doing it on LinkedIn, say you're not a bot. And uh, until next time, you know, uh, oh, how's, how's the construction on your studio going? It's going well. Uh, framing is done. We are getting um, plumbing starting to put in. It was funny. I was talking to the contractor, though. Um, they have another job and somebody else is putting in a recording studio. Into there. So apparently podcast studios or Zoom studios or whatever you want to call these are a thing in the post-pandemic world. People are adding them to their house. And I want to ask, like, with the price of lumber skyrocketing, did you fix the price before you began or are you paying cost plus? Oh, it's cost plus, but I, I should have. It was already expensive when we started. It was all-time highs in city. I should have built this two years ago when we were Kick, when when it was a uh, you know we were kicking around the idea should we do this should we not do this and then you know 
COVID came and now, yeah. now basically it's the COVID edition, right? It's an office, a home office, a place for elderly family, right? And then a bedroom because we lost a bedroom to do the remodel, right? So essentially it's, it's the, it's the typical COVID edition. Well, and I am going to post the picture of David's latest progress on his, uh, cloud accounting podcast recording studio on our Instagram. So do follow us on Instagram. We are at cloud account pod cloud, a C C T P O D. Uh, and you'll get the head headliner. Um, you'll get a little preview of every episode if you subscribe and then you'll also see the pictures of David's uh, new studio that's being built. It'd be really exciting when it's actually, because it's really a closet, but when I actually turn it into a studio, that's when the pictures should be exciting. That I'm, I'm looking forward to. Well, until next week, David, uh, stay safe, stay sane, and we'll uh, chat. We'll chat soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Time for the classifieds. I quickly wanted to let you know about a new project that I've been working on for the last year or so. I'm launching a podcast network called Accounting Podcast Network. It has new podcasts that I know you'll love, like the Accounting Salon Conversations podcast hosted by Amanda Aguilar and the Accounting Automation Workflows podcast co-hosted by Brian Clare and Heather Satterley. Head over to accountingpodcastnetwork.com. That's accountingpodcastnetwork.com. With new tech coming out from around the world each day, how do you filter out the noise and find the best tech for your firm? Launch for Accountants is a tech discovery platform made for accounting firm owners. Here are just a few of the most popular launches from the month of January. A web-based tool for building narratives around your 10 key tapes, a PPP forgiveness utility, and a financial modeling platform that integrates with your entire cloud stack. To learn more, sign up for the weekly newsletter at launchfa.com. Looking to radically increase productivity as a QuickBooks Pro Advisor? Instead of juggling a tech stack with your practice, you can now track and manage your workflow, communicate with clients, and manage files, all in one single powerful yet amazingly simple platform, Client Hub. When you leverage Client Hub's all-in-one platform that goes across your team and your clients, magic happens. Ready to start feeling that in your firm? Start your free trial at clienthub.app today. Use promo code CAP25 to receive 25% off your first three months. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.